throughout the world, the unique place of Stirling in the history of Scotland is legend. Year after year, visitors come from the farthest corners of the world here to Stirling Castle to gaze out across a tapestry of distant battlefields and hear perhaps echoes of times past. Times when Stirling's prominence in Scotland was unquestioned. Times when the dominance of its rock over all the karst land gave rise to its fortifications and eventually the castle as we see it today. And today, Stirling still marks the crossroads of Scotland, the true heartland of Scottish tourism, with easy access to national road and rail networks and only 45 minutes from Glasgow or Edinburgh airports. But I want to take you for a few moments to another Stirling, the Stirling of the future. I want to show you a few glimpses of things to be, or more importantly, of things that could be in the Stirling future world. Every journey has to have a beginning, and we start ours here in the Stirling of today. Stirling, like its castle, has evolved. Centuries of different influences have been brought to bear upon its history. The generations have made their mark, each in their own way. Well, Stirling District Council has recognized the responsibility of this generation. And in Stirling Future World, it's produced a plan of action which is radical, adventurous, visionary, some might even say preposterous. But hear me out. The basic concept of Stirling Future World is about change. Taking the area known locally as Stirling's top of the town and turning it into one of Europe's foremost heritage and craft centres, with the potential of being not just Scotland's greatest tourist attraction, but the greatest tourist attraction in all Europe. We're now outside the Smith Art Gallery and Museum, of which more in a moment. But the first area earmarked for radical change lies just behind it. Here at the foot of the town rock, a revolution in transport will be housed. On this site, there will be built a major interchange where visitors arriving by car or coach will start their journey into the future world. It's not a very inspiring sight just now, perhaps, but give your imagination free range. Since there are plans to pedestrianize much of the top of the town area and restrict traffic access to others, a completely new system of getting people about will have to be created. Self-drive electric cars, special circular route buses, and a two-way glass-covered escalator snaking its way up through the trees, up there to the back walk which runs along the outside of the old town wall. So up here on this magnificent eagle's perch, we're about to enter an area which will be almost entirely dedicated to the service of tourism and the redevelopment of a local craft community. The area covered by Stirling Future World comprises some 68 hectares, over 70% of which is designated an outstanding conservation area. And in it are housed no fewer than 116 listed buildings and many scheduled ancient monuments. The Smith Art Gallery and Museum, where we started our journey, is a prime example of the quality of heritage that Stirling can offer. The Smith was completed in 1873 and originally housed the art collection of Thomas Stuart Smith, who died in 1869. 
in its prime position at the interchange. It lends itself beautifully to the plan to develop it as a site for major national touring exhibitions, a purpose for which it is uniquely well suited. And so, on through the original town wall, and a visit first to a truly dramatic step back in time. Although sadly derelict for many years now, the detention barracks here were built in 1846 as a replacement for the old jailhouse and the toll booth. It's a dramatic sight, even in this sorry state, and it's often mistaken on the Stirling skyline for part of the castle itself. It's downright scandalous. It really is that such an imposing example of 19th century architecture, right in the heart of Stirling, should ever have been allowed to deteriorate to such a tragic extent, and that so few people have ever been able to experience its very real sense of drama. But it would be even more scandalous if we didn't seize a chance now to restore its dilapidated grandeur. Since this is to be one of the first staging posts in a trip through the revitalized top of the town, it's essential that the spirit behind the plan should be evident right from the outset. And the plan is to restore this fine building to its former glory, and then use it to house a permanent exhibition that tells the story of the people of Stirling through the centuries. Part of the Smith collection would be used for the telling, and there'd be a special display devoted to the history of the barracks themselves. This project is all about the combination of heritage and modern technology, and the idea is to marry the two by relaying actuality panoramic views of the surrounding environs into the exhibition area by means of rooftop TV cameras. The site is not limited to the barracks themselves, and these existing but sadly ruinous buildings will make for community workshops, bringing renewed life and vitality to the area. From here we'll be able to move on out to St John Street, or we can make one detour to another item of special interest. This is the original site of the Erskine Marykirk which was first built in 1740 for the Reverend Ebenezer Erskine as a result of divisions within the Presbyterian churches. Although it was one of Scotland's smallest sectarian congregations, its members came from far and wide, incredibly some people even walking all the way from Glasgow and back of a weekend just to hear him preach. Erskine died in 1754 and was buried under the floor of his church where the Ebenezer Monument now stands. Later the church was moved up the slope a bit and the present Erskine Mary Kirk was rebuilt on a new site in 1826 backing onto the brink of the Castle Rock. And then in that terrible hurricane of 1969, remember, its roof was irreparably damaged and all but the imposing facade was demolished for safety reasons and there the rubble still lies. It's a sorry sight, just like the detention barracks, and is one that we should all be ashamed of as custodians of the past. The task will be to turn the clock back and to create behind that hollow facade a museum of Scottish churches, with the courtyard area in front of it landscaped as open space and the Ebenezer Monument restored to its former splendor.
By the time that future world is a reality, all through traffic will have been banned from this area. Already there's a wealth of history to be seen within a few paces walk in any direction. The Church of the Holy Rood, Stirling's principal church since before Columbus set sail for America. James VI's coronation took place here in 1567, the service being preached by a certain John Knox. Behind the Holy Rood stands a guild hall, founded between 1639 and 1649 as an almshouse or hospital for elderly members of the Guild of Merchants. The statue of its founder, John Cowan, stands in waiting for Hogmanay, when it's reputed he joins the revellers as the old year dies. The terrace overlooks the bowling green, which is the second oldest in Britain after Plymouth of Sir Francis Drake fame. Mar's work was completed around 1570 by the Earl of Mar, Regent of Scotland. All that remains today of a quite magnificent Renaissance palace is what you see here. But in its time, it was a superb example of the stonemason's work. James VI and his queen lived here while the castle was being prepared for their reception. And there are more far more than we have time for here, but all adding to the future world experience. The last pupils walked the corridors of this Stirling High School some 22 years ago, but its scholastic connections go back well over three centuries. Originally, a one-story grammar school was built in this site, and then over the course of its history, it was enlarged and reconstructed until the buildings as we see them today were erected in 1854. Its place in Stirling's future world is destined to be as a youth hostel and study centre with recreation and games facilities. But as part of the revitalisation of commerce in the top of the town, much of it would also be used by local companies as manufacturing premises producing goods for the tourist market. A restaurant would also provide a service to employees and visitors alike and indeed for the local community who'd be allocated part of the scheme as a community centre. And to make all this possible, it'll be necessary to continue the architectural style and complete the quadrangle. Not a simple project, but one with all the promises of new life and revived interest. Around the year 1600, you could hardly hear yourself even think in this part of the town. Broad Street was then the focus of all life in Stirling, and on Saturdays, rows of temporary stalls offered everything from geese, chickens, butter and eggs, to tallow, candles, belts and gloves. There were permanent merchants' booths projecting from the buildings over the more exotic goods from overseas. Wine, chestnuts and walnuts from Bordeaux, onions and bottles from Flanders, iron, pitch, tar and wax from Danzig, paper, pens and inkhorns from France, silks and velvets from Holland. From the Market Cross here, the Market Cross, all the important announcements and edicts were made and punishments were meted out in full public view and humiliation. Prisoners were incarcerated in the tollbooth which was completed in the form we see it now in 1705. The tollbooth combined the functions of town hall and jailhouse, and the wretched miscreants incarcerated therein suffered a variety of fates. Public hangings were a feature of top of the town life until as late as 1823, when a certain Alan Mayer was hanged for murdering his wife. The fact that he was 84 years old at the time deterred no one, least of all himself. This broken flagstone once held the shackles for the prisoners' legs. In fact, prison conditions in the toll booth were anything but luxurious. This was the attic death cell in which John Baird and Andrew Hardy were held in 1820, 
before being taken out to be publicly hanged and then beheaded for leading a workers' riot. Steps have already been taken to open the toll booth for limited access, but the plans are to develop and promote it as an art centre, creating a true focal point for community life. There'll be opportunities for theatre, video, concerts, craft studios, workshops, meeting rooms and restaurants, and events in the toll booth will be encouraged to overflow into Broad Street. And back out here in Broad Street, we should see another transformation. To draw the centre of activity back here from the lower town, fairs and markets and carnivals and the like would be re-established with all the colour and excitement of summer street theatre. In fact, the whole theatre of town life. To complete the atmosphere, ground floor flats would be converted back to commercial use as shops, craft workshops, restaurants, all designed to breathe life back into the heart that once was. We're still in the shadow of the toll booth here, but this splendid little building is known as Richie's Boys Club, with its stern injunction on how to get on in life. Quarrelling is taboo. It's here that a youth club will be created to become a focus for much of the community's younger generation to play the game. This is Argyle's Lodging, further up the Castle Wind, and is named after the fourth Duke of Argyle who bought it in 1764. Part of it dates right back to the 16th century and it's been added to gradually over successive ownerships. Argyle's lodging will become available for use as a genealogy centre, where the fascination of family histories, ancestry and heritage could be researched. It would also be the ideal home for the Stirling archives. We're still in the castle wine, with the castle itself just beyond us, hidden from view by its outer wall. This was once a, a bustling, lively communications artery between the town and its castle, but these days it languishes in almost total seclusion, a breakwater that comes to some sort of life only in the tourist season. As a further move to revitalize this whole area, a prestige hotel development is planned. This will be linked to increased activities within the castle limits and over to the Gowan Hill. And here before us, a brand new exciting entrance to the castle would be created. And here we are at the very pinnacle of the proposed achievements. And just as the castle has evolved over so many yesterdays, so will these changes be seen as tomorrow's contribution to that evolution. It's perhaps a little hard to imagine how the more visionary proposals could ever come to fruition. But what's needed above all is a marriage of goodwill and cooperation, of public spirit and private enterprise, and with that whole mountains can be moved. And I say that because the proposals for the Esplanade, where we are now, and for the Gowan Hill, just out of sight beyond the Esplanade wall, are the most adventurous of the whole future world plan. They epitomize the pioneering spirit of future world and bring a final majestic element of futurism to the whole project. Up here on the Esplanade, all that we can see at present is a broad expanse of tarmac for parking and parading. But underneath the Esplanade in historic times, there used to be a deep valley, the so-called Stirling Valley, which served as an additional line of defense for the castle. What Future World proposes is to excavate the Esplanade and recreate this Stirling Valley, and then use the space to create a dramatic walk-through history park, landscaped on different levels, that would give visitors an enthralling introduction to the glories of the castle itself. It would give the castle a spectacular new dimension of interest, without in any way compromising its historical integrity or its substantial dignity. Before going into the castle itself, let's pause here for a moment on the Gowan Hill on the eastern approach. Below us, the River Forth stretches on towards the sea. Stirling Bridge, where so many of Scotland's struggles were focused, lies just below us. And across the Carse, the Wallace Monument stands as a stark reminder of heroic aspiration.
Imagine a building where all the latest in holography and audiovisual presentation techniques will unfold before you a journey through time in the creation of the Fourth Valley. Imagine a building which will give unrestricted views over the whole Stirling Karst and the Highlands beyond. Imagine a building which will offer every good reason to linger on history, to enjoy the most advanced computer and video experiences. And then you'll be able to imagine the time-link spectacular that will stand here, rooted in the enduring rock of Stirling. I suppose finally that this is what it's all about. Stirling Castle has been one of Scotland's principal fortresses for more than 800 years. Today, nothing remains of the earlier structures, however. Most of the present buildings and inner defences were built during the century preceding the Union of the Crowns in 1603, when the castle had been in regular use as a royal residence. The castle consists of many splendid chambers, but none more splendid than the Great Hall, which is presently undergoing restoration by the Ancient Monuments Division of the Scottish Office. Here, James VI celebrated with a banquet of unprecedented splendor the baptism of his first son, Prince Henry. But after the union of the crowns and the king's departure for England, the castle became a garrison. And in the middle of the last century, it was made the regimental depot of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. The proposals here are designed to enhance the regalities of the place, to make the most of the castle spaces, by night as well as by day, to create events and activities to attract even more visitors and to encourage participation by local residents. This would include the use of the castle wherever possible as a centre for conferences and historical banquets, closely linked with the hotel trade and tourist operators. Sterling Future World is a heroic plan, and it'll take heroism to bring it into being. But it's not just about places and attractions. It's also about people, the 1,800 people who live already in the top of the town and the hundreds and thousands of visitors will bring their buying power into the area to create new employment and new commercial possibilities. Last year, nearly a quarter of a million visitors came to Stirling Castle, but most of them were on planned itineraries and tight schedules dictated by others. Their stays were usually short, with barely enough time to do more than take in the briefest tour of the castle in the visitor centre. Sterling Future World is designed to put the pride back into an area which houses some of Scotland's proudest historical assets and to make a much longer stay here, of days even, not only desirable but essential. To take advantage of a new united approach to tourism, the District Council would actively encourage manufacturing, craft and service industries with perhaps even the formation of a special company to manufacture and promote quality goods with sterling links. Even daring to think of putting all these proposals into effect might seem an impossible dream. But anyone who reads the story of Robert the Bruce will know that one man's achievements against staggering odds far eclipsed anything that's being proposed here. But it will need the spirit of Bruce to succeed and an army of enthusiasts to achieve it. With Stirling Future World, Stirling District Council are putting out a clarion call to all those who care about Scotland's past and how best to preserve it and present it for the benefit of all and for the generations to come. The hope is that all of you, both lay and learned, doers and dreamers alike, will seek ways of turning this vision into reality and of creating for Stirling a future world that's worthy of its great past. Thank you.